are listening to the Discerning Leader Podcast, brought to you by Leadership Transformations, the podcast that helps you practice a preference for God. And now, here's your host, Steve Machia. Thank you, dear friend, for joining us on the Discerning Leader Podcast, where together we're discovering how best to practice a preference for God in all aspects of our personal lives and relationships, in our leadership, and in our service to others. My name is Steve Machia, and I welcome you on behalf of the entire Leadership Transformations team. Our ministry focuses on the spiritual formation, discernment, and renewal of leaders and learners who are serving the church and building up God's kingdom worldwide. To learn more about our ministry and to sign up for Pathways, our weekly e-newsletter, simply go to leadershiptransformations.org. And now as we enter into today's episode, let me invite you, let me invite all of us to take a deep breath, to slow down and attend to what God wants to say to us today. And let's prayerfully reflect for just a brief moment on the reality of the initiating presence of our triune God, evidenced in the loving compassion of our Heavenly Father, the forgiving grace and mercy of our Savior Jesus, and the empowering presence of the Spirit we call holy. Let us hold fast to an awareness of God's presence, his power, and his peace. And let's trust God even more deeply today. Friends, as we begin our episode, I want to encourage you to receive the Word of God from Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Friends, we do not want to grow weary and lose heart in the midst of a life filled with entanglements in our soul, in our society, in our inner and exterior worlds. Instead, we want to fix our eyes on Jesus and be attentive to all that he has to say to us. Friends, we're in the midst of season 31, which we have entitled Discerning God in Slowness. And my conversation partner is my co-host of the Discerning Leader podcast, Brother Matthew Scott. Matt, welcome back to the Discerning Leader podcast. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. I look forward to this conversation together. I always do. Your presence in all of our lives is pure gift, and you are the epitome of the topic that we're talking about today, because you are such a good listener and very attentive. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Slow down and be more attentive. That's a big word, huge word. And I love that Hebrews passage because it reminds us of who we're to be most attentive to, and that is Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who has gone before us, has experienced everything and then some of what we experience in this life, and yet he gave himself so that we can have an abundant life. What a gift, what a joy. Yeah, Steve, I, as you're just reading this passage and I'm considering this idea, this practice of offering our attentive presence, you know, to one another and first and foremost to God, I just think about the work that we are involved in each and every day and in many ways, what we're inviting people to do is just to slow 
down so that you can put your eyes back on Jesus. We all know and are bombarded by things all day, every day, that our eyes start to drift and our focus and our attention starts to drift. But we want to keep our attention and our eyes fixed, gazed upon Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Yeah, so how do we do that? I mean, that sounds glorious, sounds wonderful, sounds very holy. Um, let's talk about how do we do that in this particular age that we find ourselves in, because most of us have an inability to slow down rather than, a, than an a ability to slow down. Yeah. Why is that? Why do you think that is? Well... I think from a very practical standpoint, so many of us, and I would put myself in that camp as well, life is too complex. It is too overwhelming. We have accumulated too much. We're trying to steward too much. We're trying to hold too much. We're trying to maintain too much. And I think one of those primary areas of life is that we, we often have too many relationships and too many roles. And Steve, I know that in your work on crafting a rule of life and how you've sat with people for decades in that work, that is the place to begin, is to start really giving an honest assessment of our roles and relationships. And um, I think you've said before, how many is it that we can kind of healthily uh, steward and hold? It's very yeah. few. It's very few, it's probably five to seven. And most of the people that we work with have at least twice that number. Some have even like three times or four times that number. That was my problem years ago. And it's, and that has become my problem again, having way too many roles in this life that I don't give my relationships the priority that they deserve. And until we really figure that out, uh, we're going to continue to spin, kind of spin out of control. I, I was thinking of that just last week. Um, I got an email from, from a person I've never met before who has a concern about something related to our ministry and asked this question. This guy has nothing to do with us, really, and but it heard something, so wanted to speak up, you know, sort of send his concern directly to me. And I realized here I am giving this person an inordinate amount of time in a very full ministry day when he's not in my priority roles and relationships. And it was a very small matter. It was not a major, major matter. Um, but we can easily kind of spin out of control with the numbers of people demanding our attention. And it used to be a long time ago, we used to talk about having uh, in business or in ministry, having an open door policy or a closed door policy. Uh, and what it, we meant by that is, is your door always open so the person can come in and just sort of interrupt whatever you're doing in your workday? Or do you close the door and make sure that everyone around you makes an appointment to come and see you? The point being, you're going to be far more effective if you watch for the the time eaters or the life suckers that are going to come into our into our life so we have the internet now we have email now so they don't have to be knocking on any door they can just send us an email and all of a sudden those emails become major distractions and i can't be attentive to the priority issues if i'm always being pulled off by the tertiary or the the fourth or fifth priority and so that role and that relationship, I like, how much time am I going to give this person in responding to this email to be gracious and kind and to answer the question, but not to lose too much of my day as a result? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think too many roles, too many relationships, we do have to be careful and prioritize the ones that matter the most. Yeah, and some of those relationships they come to us based on you know our area of influence and leadership and you know a community that we're serving in or a job that we have or you know family stuff there's other relationships that we chase after and pursue ourselves 
And there's, I've often thought about the, the word accessibility of how accessible we are. I mean, I, I still do remember a day where the phone was connected to the wall and it had a cord on it. And there was this thing called an answer machine and you'd like go out to dinner and then you come back and there's a light and someone called and you weren't there. Well, that is not the world that we live in any longer and text messaging and, you know, all sorts of apps that we have. It's just this assumption and this, I think there's an assumption and there's also an expectation obligation that we feel like we need to respond immediately or always or in the moment or quite readily. And um, that, that in and of itself has us so distracted and um, it's very hard for us to be attentive to God, much less even one another. Yeah. And we live on these fast paced trains that are going 70 miles an hour and we're missing so much around us. Matt, you found this great quote by Anthony DeMello. Let's step back for a second and just, would you read that for us? Because that is a great reminder of this topic for today. Yeah, I, well, I think, you know, kind of the paraphrase is that Anthony DeMello talks about us. We're like people who ride around on a bus with the shades pulled down. <laughs> All around us, there's scenic beauty majestic landscapes, glorious creation, and we miss it completely. Yeah. I mean, I think if we're just honest, that is so true of our lives daily. Mm -hmm. And maybe what, maybe like one of, I tend to talk a lot about our phones, my phone, but I do wonder if you know, you see people at restaurants or you see people out at parks or I live at the beach. You see people out in the, at the beach and what are they doing? They're on their phones. Right. That's kind of the whole, the same idea of like the shades are pulled down. You're on a bus and you're missing all this goodness of God all around you. Um, you've got your blinders on. You're completely unaware of what's, what's happening. Yeah. And we're going at a pace where we, we don't know how to smell the roses anymore. We haven't really stopped to, to enjoy the beauty that surrounds us, to enjoy a meal with a loved one, to enjoy a conversation where we can look at each other's eyes. I, I, I love that Hebrews passage, fix our eyes on Jesus. I've said this a hundred times, My, Ruth's preschool teaching I, telling the three-year-old, I need to see your eyes. And mm -hmm. when I see your eyes, then we will, we will talk about whatever needs to be discussed. And it's so true. We, we fix our attention with our eyes and everything else follows. When we don't have our eyes fixed on each other or on Jesus or on the task at hand, we get easily distracted. We get pulled off and we lose our attention. And it's it's really not true that you can double task or triple task or multitask. It's just you can only do one thing at a time effectively well. Um, so when we slow down and we want to become more attentive, it literally means slow down. So in the bullet train analogy of 70 miles an hour, we need to actually get off that train and notice the beauty that surrounds us on the landscape or on the blade of grass or on the beautiful flowers or with the people that we are doing life with so that we can be more attentive. Um, Rick was in town uh, last month for a few days. We took a train ride on the T going into Boston. And at one point we looked at each other and said, who doesn't have an iPhone? Literally every single person yeah. around us on the train was looking at their phone. There wasn't one that was doing something else. Every single person, there's probably 30 people around us on this train, and not one of them uh, gave eye contact to anyone else around them. We are addicted to these phones, and our heads are down when they should be looking up and around. And I worry about, you know, I've got, I've got three little grandson, two grandsons and a granddaughter, three, three grandchildren. I worry about what we're doing around them and that we're not focused on them. 
and that the people that are caring for them, their school or whatever, uh, we our kids and grandkids need to be attended to. And it's one thing for us to talk about fixing our eyes on Jesus, and that is so true. And in our spiritual life, that is our number one relational priority. But the people around us deserve our attention as well. If they mm -hmm. don't get it from us, they're going to get it from somewhere else. And most likely it'll be an unhealthy place rather than a healthy place. So, Matt, I don't want to miss the scenic beauty, the majestic landscapes, the glorious creation by living a life with the shades down all the time. That's just, that seems incredibly, what? It's tragic. It's tragic. <laughs> it is. That's a better word. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we avoid that tragedy? Because we live fa fast-paced, high-tech, high-speed lives. I don't know if that's going to change, right? I don't I don't think that's going to change. Um, we're in a hurry. The whole world around us is in a hurry. The only time we're not in a hurry is when we're forced to stop because not many of us are choosing to stop, even though another topic we could cover would be Sabbath. On Sabbath rest, we're supposed to stop and take that routine break so that we can pay greater attention to the things that matter, the people that matter, the issues that matter the most. But we're living these fast-paced, uh, high-speed, high-tech lives. And yeah, we need to learn how to step off the treadmill or hop off the bullet train in order to become more attentive. So can we flip mm -hmm. it upside down a little bit? Let's talk about how can we become more attentive, Matt? Yeah. Well, I would say a couple of things come to mind, but since we began talking about relationships and roles, I remember a very good friend of mine said years ago, and I still think about this regularly. He talked about his capacity or embracing his capacity, embracing limitations. And he said, smaller garden, deeper roots. Mm. Mm. And I just love that imagery. Mm. Um, I love that invitation. Because I know in my life, there's been many seasons where it's like, if I'm considering a garden, I'm trying to expand the footprint of it, right? You're trying to, to, to make it extend further and further and further and get a larger footprint, if you will. And so that's accumulate more relationships, accumulate more roles, because that gives us since kind of a false sense of, value and identity and worth right and we can be helpful in other people's lives and we can be called upon and we can be needed and we can show up as this kind of person in their time of need or however it is and and we're running ourselves ragged and we're not able to really be fully present with the amount of people that we're trying to be in relationship with and so i'd say a smaller garden deeper roots and for each of us to pay attention to why am I not satisfied with tending to my spouse and my children and a few other people? Why does, why does the relational list have to go so long? Because I think when we explore that, then we explore a deeper issue, right? That needs attention. Yeah. Like how many likes on Facebook or how many followers on Instagram or how many people are involved in our work or in our life or our ministry or how many people are getting pathways, our wonderful weekly newsletter, everything's measured by numerics. Yeah. Um, and so we're always counting noses and counting dollars and counting butts and seats. And, you know, I, I think we've got the wrong set of metrics, Matt. Mm. And I'm, I'm old enough to be able to say that, uh, having seen what I've seen over the years, it's just, I think the metrics uh, need to be flipped upside down. Yes, of course, budgets need to be covered and buildings need to be paid for and programs need to be uh, covered by people who are actually engaged in them and, and it's meaningful for them. Um, but if it's always what's new, what's next, what's now, what's bigger, what's bolder, what's brighter, um, that that is a pressure point that eventually 
takes people to the wall where they hit the wall and they don't know what to do because they're stunned by how hard it's been, how self-sacrificing and other sacrificing it's been. And as a result, we're not focused appropriately on where God wants us to be because we're kind of spinning out of control with the demands of others. So I love that smaller garden, deeper roots. Mm -hmm. Or how about a manageable size garden, <laughs> yeah. deeper roots, so that we don't overextend ourselves, uh, but instead set some limits. Um, what would be some of the limits that we want to aim at to accomplish? I, I would say it's, again, more of the realistic. What is realistic for our garden? What's realistic for our ministry? Can we celebrate when some church or organization or business is doing better than us numerically? And can we rejoice with them and celebrate their accomplishments? I think that's hard to do because we get kind of jealous and we get competitive and we get a little smaller as a result every time we're comparing and contrasting and wishing that our garden were bigger like the one down the street. So mm -hmm. yeah, setting limits, um, having more realistic expectations, that'll help us become more attentive to what's in front of us. Yeah, Stephen, as you talk about limits, uh, I, I've been working on this for a while and I've seen some growth. I have a lot, um, a lot of growth ahead of me in this way, but just setting realistic expectations of what you can accomplish within a day's time or an hour's time. Yeah. And that, I think that creates such unnecessary hurry and angst inside of each of us. And as we're talking about attentiveness, I mean, I'm sure everybody has been in, you've been in that place where you set up a Zoom call from 11 to 12, and then you set up another one from 12 to one, right? right? And then at 11.56, the big decision has to be made, or someone shares something deeply profound, or you're like in the heart of the conversation. And what happens in that place? Got to go. You check out, yeah. right? You either like you either stay in the conversation, but you're actually not in the conversation anymore because then you start to think about the next thing that you're going to. Right. You're like, well, how am I going to deal with this? Or you're like, well, I'm pretending I'm listening, but I'm actually texting this person and letting them know I'm going to be five minutes late. And then it's and we haven't created margin. We haven't created space. And at this point, we're not really present to either of the people. Our attention is all over the map. And, and if we keep living that way and keep doing that sort of thing, that's not loving to one another. No. And it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's this whole adrenaline fix that we have found ourselves on in our generation, you know, and the phone primarily has done this to us because we can't live without touching it and looking at it several hundred times a day. I mean, the, the statistics are staggering how many times we touch and look at that phone. That phone needs to be put away. That phone needs to put, be put to bed. That phone needs to be left on the outskirts of the circle of connection that you're, if you're always being interrupted and if that's okay, then that person is never going to be fully attentive to you. If we're, oh, just got to, let me catch this for a minute. Oh, let me just respond to that text or let me, mm -hmm. let me pick up this call. Sorry, let me, I got to take this call. And so we we do this constant interruptions, so we're we're not at all attentive. Yeah, because it is it is killing our soul. It really, really is, and we're all guilty, including me. So I have to I have to make sure that I'm putting that phone to bed at a reasonable time, and not yeah, not sleeping with it, not being awakened by it, no, giving it a break, giving mm -hmm. it its own rest rest from technology for the technology's sake, as well as mostly for my sake, my loved one's sake, et cetera. Yeah. And if we can do that, and when we do that, then we can begin to prioritize verbs like gaze, mm. talk about eye contact, mm -hmm. like gazing into the eyes of another, yeah. 
person dwelling Mm -hmm. sitting and remaining and dwelling and lingering Mm. i mean it's very infrequent probably that someone says well how what how was your day what did you do today i just i just dwelled in this space for like an excessive period of time to the to the point where it just felt really inefficient and like i was wasting time i just dwelled i lingered i remained we don't do that enough um, we don't. Another word would be abide. You know, yeah. To abide. I wonder about those four words, Matt. Gaze, dwell, remain, abide. For those who are listening in on this podcast, send us send us an email, admin at leadershiptransformations.org. Tell us how you gaze or dwell or remain or abide. We want to hear from you. Uh, this podcast is for you, our friends and LTI family members in every sector of uh, this U.S. as well as abroad. We want to hear from you, friends, because we are serious about gazing, dwelling, remaining, and abiding. And if we don't get to the place where we're becoming more familiar with those words in, in actuality, we won't know what it's like to slow down and be more attentive. What about carving out space, Matt? One one last word before we close here. How do we how do we carve out space to reflect? I know you do this really, really well in one particular discipline. Will you tell us about that? Yeah. I think an important discovery for me a while ago is that we can't we, we can't add any more time to our day or to our life. Right. Whether you're CEO or you're living in um, levels of severe poverty, what we all share is the same 24 hours a day. And it's what we do with that time and how we're steward it and how we guard it and protect it and how we use it. And so we, we can't add time, but we can carve out space. And so for me, I try to have the first, um, first part of my day every day be analog time yeah. where I'm, I'm not with my phone. I'm not with my computer. Uh, I'm with the word of God, uh, other books, journals, pen and paper, and it's analog time. And I'm just fine. I'm so much more present. I'm so much more um, aware of what is going on inside of me and and the presence of God and what he is inviting me into. Um, because what technology has done is it has sped up so many things and brought so many things to our fingertips that we previously didn't have, but we're also our muscle memory and the, our brains are, are now trained to scroll and to scan and to swipe and um, to have 14 different windows open in our computer and, you can't do it like if you're holding one book, you have to work a lot harder to experience life that way. And so the analog time for me has just been huge. So I love that. And I want to encourage everyone listening in to consider their own analog time um, as opposed to digital time, always being on our machines or our phones. So, Matt, thank you for a little bit of a conversation here about attentiveness. I hope that we've uh, sparked some interest in some of those key words to gaze, to dwell, to remain, and to abide. And uh, we want to hear from our friends as to how they're learning how to do this, because this is not easy. It is counterproductive. It is counterintuitive. It is countercultural. Um, we got to learn how to do this. We got to choose to do this. And like uh, the passage in Hebrews, we have to throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, run with perseverance the race marked out for us, which is our world, but we're fixing our eyes on Jesus and slowing down in the midst of the fullness of our lives. Matt, let's pray, and then we'll pick up this conversation next time as we continue this important series on discerning God in slowness. Father, thank you for your attentiveness to us. 
how you have your eyes fixed on us 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We receive your gaze with thanksgiving. Help us by your grace to dwell in you, to abide in you, and to return that gaze in attentive and slower ways as we want to know your heart and we want to live fully for you. So help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. To fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, in whose name we pray and give thanks. Amen. The Discerning Leader Podcast is made possible by the generosity of friends like you. To encourage our team with a gift of any amount, please visit leadershiptransformations.org. Send along a note with your gift. We'd love to hear from you. Remember, a listening leader is a discerning leader. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Discerning Leader Podcast.